I've been asked this question many times as to what, how should investors approach these companies? And I would like to have a standard investment approach to all of these, right? That being that, look at them as call options. You buy into some of them, maybe all, all of them. A few of them will turn out to be complete lemons. They will not do, go anywhere. They will lose complete value. But you could have a few winners over here as well, right? We don't know. It could be a car trade. It could be a Nike. It could even be a Paytm. Because the, they're evolving their business model as well. Their acquisition, they're acquiring companies. They can get acquired as well, right? So, but the business that they're doing now. Hey guys, welcome to the 47th episode of our podcast. We're here with our returning guest, Mr. Deepan Mehta, to talk about the new age digital companies that have been listed and that are coming up for listing as well. So primarily, we're going to be covering Zomato, Nika, which is known as FSN Ecom, PB Fintech, which is the uh, operating entity for Policy Bazaar, Rate Gain Travel Technologies, Car Trade Tech, and 197 Communications, which is known as Paytm. And uh, I just want to ask by, by generally getting your thoughts on these companies, because ever since listing, they've had a really rough time across the board, except for rate gain travel technologies. From the time of listing till today, most of these companies have barely made any returns. And most of them have, in fact, if I look at Nika, PB Fintech, Cartridge Tech, and 197, have all lost a lot of money. So Matto has been just about average. So can you talk us through the journey of these companies as a whole has been like in the market since listing? Okay, well, thank you for inviting me and a pleasure to be over here. So somewhere around, I think, 2020, when it was uh, COVID time, SEBI tweaked its rules and it permitted loss-making startups to get listed on the main board. So until that point, they could not be a listing. And that uh, you know kind of uh, changed the mindset amongst a lot of these new age companies. In any case, I think once you start a digital company and you've gone for that one, two, three, four rounds of uh, private equity investing, then the natural aspiration is to get listed on BSE or NSE. And uh, these companies took, uh, you know, took advantage of this uh, relaxation and they went for IPOs. And the IPOs got phenomenal response because these are, end of the day, these are concept companies. And in India and elsewhere in the world also, when a concept, one of its kind company gets listed, it gets the fancy of the investors. So these companies got the fancy of the investors and they got listed at huge premiums. Of course, they were even, the IPO price also was in a way overpriced. And that's how this phenomena started. And we got these four or five companies listed, but it had an ugly turn. And, you know, the rest is history, as you know. Yeah, so I think over the last uh, year or so, year and a half or so, it seems like a lot of them have changed focus from growth to now profitability. Is that a response to you know, the lack of investor interest in loss-making companies, the lack of investors willing to continue to allow them to be loss-making. So I think there's a very interesting phenomena here. I want to just take a minute to explain that the investor in an unlisted startup has a very different mindset and analytical skills and assessment uh, matrix as compared to an investor in the public markets. Public markets, we are used to price to earnings ratio, return on capital employed, r- rate of growth of the revenues, operating profit margins. So without these are the common tools which one takes. And then we compare that business with similar businesses to arrive at a price to earnings multiple. So that's the mindset of the investor in the public market. In the private equity market, the fund manager or the investor knows that these companies are loss making. And they are different analytical tools like, you know, uh, it could be number of eyeballs or number of uh, users on the platform, average order value, and then they extrapolate that and then they give a valuation to it. So that was the disconnect, which, uh, you know, is still there. And that is the reason why expectations were high in the public market when they got listed. But when actually the results started to come out, people realized that, look, boss, we cannot see any visibility of these earnings. And that was the message which went from the investors of the public market to these companies. And therefore, they changed their strategy to focus more on bottom line and not just growing the top line or burning cash. Fair enough. So why don't we do a couple of minutes in each of these companies? Sure. Then I'll come to the future of this 
sector as a whole and you know what future prospects look like so let's maybe start out with zomato and uh, zomato is a really interesting business do you want to break it down what they do and, and you know generally what drives their revenues and growth for our viewers so zomato has got two divisions one is a food delivery or it's a basically a food aggregator and second is quick commerce so that is uh, they have this particular um, you know uh, product where in within half an hour or one hour they can have deliveries not even blink it. yeah blink it blink it does sub 20 minutes sub 30 minute deliveries yeah. so that is one business these are two divisions of the there's company. also hyper pure which is their b2b yeah uh, sorry forgot about that uh, hyper pure also which is a b2b it's like supplies uh, ingredients to the restaurants so these are the three large businesses hyper pure is pretty small at this point of time but large percentage of revenues come from food delivery and uh, blink it so every time you order food through Zomato, they get a cut from the restaurant and they are charging you something for delivery as well. And that's how they get the, uh, basically the top line going. And same thing with Blinkit. So basically it's like a delivery channel for you. And this is a really a concept stock because they have changed the way people think in terms of ordering food and ordering groceries. Earlier, it was always you would call a restaurant and then if they had a delivery partner or they did deliveries themselves, they would deliver. And mind you, the likes of Jubilant Food Works, which ran uh, uh, Domino's, they pioneered this whole thing of delivering the pizza in 30 minutes. That was the tagline. But then Zomato has come in and they, have, they are offering this food delivery across the board to even the smallest of restaurants. And I think that the concept, it is fantastic. I mean... The way I look at Zomato is that even 10 years from now, I mean, people will be ordering food at home because they are used to it, right? The scale will be significantly higher. And this is a business which has got a very high moat. It's not easy to set up a Zomato again. You know, I mean, uh, people may try, but you know, being present in every city, getting the delivery boys in place, the connects to the restaurant, the entire software system so it arrives within time, who's going where, route is a very tough thing to do and the brand of course so i think that zomato is going to be around for a long long time and therefore as and when they grow they will reach a break-even point and they should do very well in future but just to try and talk about the future let's let's leave quick commerce and hyperpia to the side for a second let's talk about the core zomato business because there has some challenges associated with it as well and i'll lay three of those challenges out for you specifically so the first is obviously Zomato orders for most restaurants don't particularly add to their bottom line. It adds to some top line, but it doesn't really add to the bottom line. And there's a growing discontentment within the restaurant industry of the level of margins that Zomato and you know other food delivery services like, yeah. Yeah, take. Uh, the flip side is also even the riders aren't all that happy. They feel like they're being overworked, not really making enough money. And to really put a bow on top of that, ONDC, uh, which is the government's open network for digital commerce, is also coming into the segment with the um, with the easier aggregation methodology for food delivery. So does this? So you're right. Ten years, fifteen years, twenty years from now, also we're going to be ordering food. But will it still be Zomato only that we're ordering from, or do you think there's any risk of disruption here? See, ONDC is a threat, but then Zomato said that they could be a delivery partner on ONDC as well because they have the network. Right. As far as your concern about the riders, you know, their uh, not being taken care of or their grievances, that is something which Zomato is well aware of, and they are working on it. Right. And when it comes to the brand and the ease of ordering, you can't beat a Zomato. And lately, they have started even levying a subscription fee, a small amount, but the number of users which are there on the platform. It turns out to be a very big number for them. So I'm pretty certain that Zomato will do, will be around for many, many years. And uh, whatever threats are there, they can certainly handle it. You know, one thing about Zomato, they say got so much cash on their books. And that cash is strategic. So tomorrow, if any threat comes, they can spend in terms of advertising, acquisition, software upgrade, whatever it takes to protect their turf. Fair so enough. I'm pretty confident of Zomato. Of course, you know, right now the picture appears to be pretty. But of course, if things change, then we will change our opinion as well, right? Uh, let's maybe talk about the other two verticals of Zomato, Blinkit and um, Hyperpure. So Hyperpure is a really small component of the overall business. But personally, you know, I'm extremely bullish on Hyperpure because the ability to offer 
lower cost supplies of better quality direct from farm to restaurant to a lot of these cloud kitchens and mid to high end restaurants uh, that Zomato already captures through their delivery platform. Uh, I think there's a, there's huge scope for growth there. True. But it's a high margin business. Right? And it's a high margin business. But let's talk about Blinkit and quick commerce because that's attracted a lot of criticism for not being revenue positive, not being profitable, not being revenue positive, putting too much pressure on riders. Or What's your thoughts on the future of quick commerce? So the CEO of Zomato has said that Blinkit can be bigger than Zomato, which is true because, you know, end of the day, if you look at the uh, wallet share of spend share of a family, it will spend more on groceries than ordering food from outside. And the basic fundamentals are similar. So delivery uh, solution, right? So I think that Blinkit, if it is done well, it can be bigger than Zomato. But that, you know, we have to just wait and watch. And the company has got its formula right. See, execution is the key thing in India. You know that, Varun. Right. And you have to agree with me that Zomato has got the execution right. So eventually, Blinkit will turn positive cash. It will break even. And when that happens, it's going to be a trigger point for this stock. Because the real cloud on Zomato's valuation and future returns profile is Blinkit. Okay, fair enough. So let's maybe just gently and quickly flash the figures up for our viewers. Uh, and just a few things I wanted to highlight. That their revenue, Zomato's top line over the last five years, has grown at a compound rate of 50%. And that's very much in line with that gross order value, which is growing at a top line of about 40% or so. And it seems it seems though that they're uh, set for their first profitable year in FY24. And uh, last couple of quarters have been profitable. So hopefully we'll try and put those figures up as well. And from just a stock perspective, um, I mean, of course, most of the metrics of ROE and PE don't really apply because we don't have that kind of data. But uh, although the last couple of years have been terrible, this last year in particular, they've gone from 50 bucks a share to 166 bucks a share, which is really quite outstanding uh, performance for this year. I just want to add one more thing over here. The common thread across all the digital companies, and we should have covered in the opening remarks, is operating leverage. See, these companies are growing their revenue at anywhere from 30% to 200% year on year, quarter after quarter. But the expenses don't grow at the same rate. So if you extrapolate that, that, that growth in revenue and growth in cost, then you can figure out that somewhere in the near future, two, three years from now, these companies can be solidly in the positive, in the black. Right. And I think Zomato will hit that this year. So lots to see. Exactly. Let's let's move on to another company, um, FSN Ecom, or commonly known as Nika. And uh, this was also, you know, a market darling when it listed. But it's had a really rough couple of years. Um, you know, unlike, unlike Zomato, which has really recovered from its lows, it's sort of stuck there. It listed about 393, 400 or so. It's now at 150, which is uh, which is to say it's really struggled. And that sort of mirrors what's happened. Because if we looked at Zomato, <clears throat> their gross order value, uh, which is the key metric for operating leverage, that's growing at 50% compounded year on year. But here with Nika, that's over the last five years, it's flat to slightly down. So what's been the story with Nika? So Nika, I think, got listed with a lot of fanfare. And again, it's a concept stock. And their real, uh, I would say, USP is that they convince the women to buy cosmetics and beauty products through their portal. And it was a nice virtuous circle because many subscribers were there and that attracted many brands to be on their platform. Because more brands are on the platform, more subscribers came on a nice virtuous circle. And they, th they said that, look, we've got a, such a captive market. Why not go into fashion as well? So fashion and fashion accessories. And they started that division as well. But I don't think that that division has done as well as the beauty products division. Because there's more competition in the fashion business. There's MyGeo and there's Amazon and there's Flipkart and there are the existing large players, Tata Group companies, which are also offering similar service and products. So there's a lot of competition on the fashion and fashion accessories side. And on the cosmetics side also, a lot of player, players are coming into it. The existing players in the fashion industry want to offer cosmetics as well. 
So from that point of view, what the streets realized is that Nike doesn't have as strong a moat as they thought it had earlier. Also, Nike is going in for more and more physical stores. Mm-hmm. So that's going to add to the capex cost. It's going to you know add to many layers of uh, administration. It's going to reduce the return on investment. And it's going to have a gestation period to break even. So the entire story on Nike, Nike has got a bit muddled up in all of these things. And their growth rates, in my opinion, have not been up to street expectations, which is why we've seen a drastic uh, correction in the stock price. It's a good business, but it's a competitive business. And I'm not sure they have an adequate moat in place. Uh, also with Nike, I think maybe a year or so back and generally over the last couple of years, there's been a lot of chatter about the corporate governance standards or a couple of issues or scandals. Do you want to generally, you know, upgrade our views on what happened precisely there and, and why? Well, I don't think there's a corporate governance issue at Nike. So I wouldn't, you know, comment on that. But the basic problem with Nike remains around its competitive edge and overall slower growth than what Street was expecting. All right, fair enough. So we'll move on. So I want to try and talk about a different company. So, so far we've talked about Zomato and FSN. Both of them are sort of, they deliver a product or a service to you. I want to try and talk about some pure digital players now. Your PB FinTech and Reiki and Travel Technologies, and both of them have very different numbers. So let's talk about PB FinTech to start with. Um, you know, just to, just a highlight over here, they've had a great great growth in revenue and you know core online revenue in particular over the last three years um but not the best profitability numbers so do you want to generally comment on what i guess what their business model is what makes them special in and what's been going on with them so basically pb fintech uh, policy bazaar is a very interesting company they were the first i would, I would not maybe not the first but really a, a scale player when it came to buying insurance online and over the years, they have set up a very, uh, I would say, aggressive call center and physical presence as well to provide insurance policies to its customers. Now, this business, when it scales up and the trailing commissions start to come in, that's when the real profits come in. So I think that the basic business of selling policies online is gradually getting decent scale. And then second year, third year, fourth year, fifth year premiums when they start coming in, that's when they get a higher and higher commission from the insurance company. So that's a it's a nice annuity-based business, which will grow very well. So that is one part of them. The other is Pesa Bazaar, which basically is a loan aggregator. And they have a captive uh, customer base, which they're selling insurance policies to. And so therefore, they're selling loans as well over there. Something similar to what Paytm is doing and many other players are there. But it's a very, it's a product which has got a lot of synergies. And there, the uh, origination of loan is what generates the commission straight away. Right. So here you originate an insurance policy and the revenues come well into the future. The other product, you originate a loan and instantly you get a commission back from the loan, the company which has given the loan. So both business models have got good synergies and they have also scaled up very well. They have understood the pulse of the customer. So it is not just only digital, but also they have a very, uh, I would say, efficient call center which supports through voice and ensures that the deal or the actual policy or the product is completely closed. And businesses like this have got huge scale because they are gaining market share at the expense of the insurance agents who have a physical business. But, you know, I want to try and talk about this future prospect, this scale component of this, because like you said, what, you know, PTM, which we're going to discuss a little bit down the line, they're coming into the space. There's a lot of, you know, insure tech startups like Ditto and many others that are also coming into this space. And it doesn't seem like they have any particular moat other than scale. So do you do you feel positive about the growth prospects of this company as well? I would think so because insurance is still an underpenetrated sector in India. And uh, especially medical insurance. <clears throat> and uh, life insurance, just a term policies. There's good scope for growth over there. And the fact that you can compare so many policies and then take a decision, it appeals to the young generation because you're, you're used to doing everything on the, on the smartphone and there's an app available for you which can easily solve these problems, travel insurance, everything under the sun they are now actually selling. And also they, because of the scale, they're getting good support and they're able to tie up with many insurance companies as well. 
And lastly, they did with NIC as well, which are the ones so late companies they tied up with, but they've done that as well. So I'm fairly confident of the business model of uh, Policy Bazaar or PB FinTech. And in, I would go on to say that rather than buying the insurance companies which are listed, I would like to buy an aggregator like this. It can, I think the prospects are far better. You have de-risked from any specific insurance company or any specific insurance vertical. Okay, fair enough. So I, sup you, I suppose that as long as the growth continues to remain supportive, this is a, a good way to play the overall exactly. insurance space. Let's talk about rate gain. And I want to try and uh, just talk about rate gain slightly differently for a second or so, because their performance has been really quite outstanding. Uh, well, at least when you compare it with the others. From the point that they were listed three years ago, the stock price has doubled. Uh, if we look at their growth rates, their top line grown 16% over the last three years. They have positive ROCEs, ROEs. They are, you know, a profitable company, you know, if you compare them to the others. So what is the story with rate gain? So, <laughs> right place, right time. And superb technology. So it's basically a B2B player. And it connects uh, the travel portals with the actual service provider, be it a hotel or a tour operator or an airline. So they they are like the middleware between the agents which are offering all these travel products and the actual uh, hotels and airlines which provide the service. And because of the COVID, their entire business had come down to zero. But post-COVID, uh, travel generally surged. And that meant that a lot of the uh, companies in the travel space which had not been investing in technology there was a race to fulfill uh, you know to get technologically savvy and that's where this company came in and rate gain technologies provided an easy solution to both parties to quickly get connected and provide a superior experience to their customers so from that point of view i would say right place right time and their growth have been phenomenal actually speaking post covid the way travel has surged Okay, some of it could be pent up, but even after pent up, even to, to date, we are seeing that there has been a lot of, uh, you know, demand for travel and travel related products. And all of these companies in the travel industry, the entire ecosystem had under invested in technology because they had a bad time, even mm -hmm. up to COVID and then COVID really bled them. Right. You know, it was a survival for them. So they were lagging a lot in technology and here this is company which is a SaaS company software as a service provider and they could quickly connect and get uh, technologically you know, updated. So it worked very well. It's a great business model. But the difference from rate gain to the other companies you're discussing is a B2B. Other companies are B2C. So one should keep that in mind. Yeah. No, but just interestingly, with when we talk about future travel demand, I don't think that this travel demand is pent up. I think we're now in a structurally higher travel demand era because yeah. now that you know most of india has met their basic requirements the experiential expenditure is going up absolutely and travel is the largest component of that in, in so many ways so yeah I, I would i would very much agree rate gain seems to have a really really positive future yeah. ahead of it see generation z believes in experiences not assets so <laughs> travel is the is on top of the list it's like a, on terms of spending so i think it's got a great future so i just want to touch on but varun i just want to add valuations ah this is where i was going to get to because the the p ratio, ratio is, sort of yeah, yeah, p ratio is 67 ah that's the problem but at corrections i would it's on my radar if you get a sweet spot where earnings also have gone up and price remains stable or goes down. You get it sub 50 times, 40, 45 times. It's a great business. But also there's a risk factor that it can be disrupted by technology. So whereas Zomato, Nika, they are in a way insulated from technological disruption. This is a, basically a software company. I, I, I would not, I would not, uh, I would not think, think it would be so easy to disrupt it with technology. I'll give you my perspective on this, right? If rate gain has basically allowed a bunch of travel companies to integrate their, their ecosystems with APIs that rate gain provides, changing that is a huge amount of effort. Well, that's your insight. You understand technology better than me. So yeah, I, I would not I would not consider it such a huge risk. Well, that's that's neither here nor there. So I want to talk about you know another company, 
And this one actually confuses me a lot. I want to try and talk about Kartrade. Because on the surface of it, if we just look at their numbers, right? Um, revenue is positive, EBITDA growth is positive. You know, their, their core metric, which is au auction listing volume, which is the number of cars on the platform, that's positive. Um, the profitable over the last three years, profits have grown. But since listing over three years ago, they've lost half their value. So is this a case of just listing at the wrong price? Or is there something fundamentally wrong with the business? To be honest with you, and I don't understand the company in depth. And uh, of course, as is the case with all of these listings, uh, the value, the IPO price was at a significant premium. But you can't blame them. You know that 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 time that fever was there, that frenzy was there for these new age digital companies. There was no parallel. There was no other listing, and there was a desire that the public market investors wanted to get into private equity type of a investment solution. And therefore, these companies, you know, they kind of uh, did as well as they did. But look at the uh, the entire structure of the industry, automobile industry. With so many new cars coming in, the old cars, the second-hand car market is going to also grow rapidly. Today, average volumes are 10-12% in the OEM segment. So can you not expect similar in the second secondary market as well? Second yeah. sale? So that's where this company operates in. And I think that maybe, you know, uh, they have got a decent business model. But as the scale comes, I think they will do very well. And I'm not really clearly sure about their boat. But this is a company which you one should track closely because the industry it's operating in has got good growth dynamics. And if we just talk about valuations for a second, uh, even now, after all of this, they're still fairly expensive at a 47 valuation. Although when you look at rate gain, it seems cheap. And you look at, you know, some of the other seller companies we've talked about, it seems cheap, but it's still, still quite expensive, I would think. Yeah, that's right. But uh, as I said, you know, uh, you have to compare valuation with growth rates. And I think rate gain will have a higher growth rate than perhaps car trade. So from that point of view, you know, it's not apples to apples comparison. But car trade per se uh, is also operating in a highly competitive market as well. So it's not an easy company to understand, get a handle on and you know, see the roadmap to growth uh, as some of the other companies are. But certainly it's a, it's a differentiated player. And I like the secondary market, the second, second hand second cars. So I just out of curiosity, because we've done automobiles before, um, what is, because because our core thesis here was that second hand market will go at a similar rate of growth as the original car market. So where is Marathi valued at just as a benchmark? 25, 26 times okay. current year earnings. It's not, I mean, that's so, okay. But Marathi is at the, you cannot compare a P multiple of auto company with a car trade in or so. That's a manufacturing company. It's got many other, uh, you know, strengths as compared to uh, someone who, who kind of, you know, acts as a bridge between the buyer and seller and the, the second-hand market. Okay, fair enough. I suppose we'll we'll discount that comparison then, and uh, you know, monitor that closely for some more growth. So I want to come to the last company that we want to discuss, and I I think I want to actually spend a little bit of extra time on that. Oh, yes. um, Paytm or 197. <laughs> yes. um, so I want to try and split this out in a couple of segments because there's been a lot of news flow about Paytm. And I'll be honest, I'm not that up to date with this. Um, could we talk about what makes this company special, what their business model is, what their claim to fame is? Uh, maybe let's also spend some time talking about what challenges they've had recently and, and what that's how that's affected the company and the price and their business. And uh, we'll close off by looking at what the, the future looks like for Paytm. Okay, so Paytm is not an easy company to understand, track, and uh, value. Its main business is it acts as a payment aggregator. It means it's got these, uh, you know, it facilitates payments to merchants through QR code and other similar devices and services. And it's built a massive subscriber base, which is again habituated to use QR codes to make payments. So they've also changed the entire uh, you know habit of a generation. It's uh, used for peer-to-peer -peer payments as well, and they are, they are riding on the um, entire UPI platform, which the uh, 
government has created and they're among the three or four players who are on the UPI platform. But I don't think that's the more profitable business. The more profitable business is them acting as a loan aggregator. So because they have such a captive market, it is easy for them to sell financial products. And that's what they're doing. They're trying to sell loans, they're trying to sell insurance policy, they're trying to sell uh, stock broking services, DMAT services. They sell bus tickets, bus ticket tickets. tickets. Exactly. They even sell, I think, Paytm, uh, Insider. They sell you know, event tickets, organizers. They do everything, it seems. Yeah. So their motto is simple. We've got subscribers. Whatever the subscriber needs, we'll sell to them. It's like a super app which they want to create. And for a while, until this problem came with RBI, they were doing exceptionally well. I was pretty impressed with their growth rates. I was impressed with the fact that they are there was a roadmap to profitability for them. And the business model made sense that even if the payment business didn't do as well, or even if it was just breaking even, the ancillary businesses were growing pretty well. And those could suddenly become very profitable for the company. But what happened with the RBI, you know, RBI taking such stern actions against Paytm Bank, that has sought the sentiment in Paytm. See, nobody wants to buy into a company where there's a cloud over compliance. And that was the issue over here that their KYC or whatever, you know, let's not get into the details of what the issue was, but RBI felt that and they came up very heavily. And that has completely changed the model of the company in the sense that, you know, you cannot have a wallet anymore and you cannot open bank accounts in the Paytm bank. And there was a the trust factor. You're handling people's money. And if RBI comes down so heavily on you, then I'm not that comfortable using their app or putting my money in their wallet or using their services. And that's something which these companies, that Paytm will have to work around. It takes a while for these compliance issues and to regain trust of the investor. And I'm pretty certain over the next two, three quarters, their growth rates will suffer and that's reflected in the stock price. Yeah, I think it's it's gone. Paytm is also a real roller coaster. Where it sort of was in the doldrums, then it you know sort of recovered really well, and now it's come sort of come off that point once again because of these regulatory issues. It's quite a shame because uh, one thing I really wanted to highlight, just to buttress what you're saying, is that the loans distributed through that platform in FY21 was 1,400 crores, in FY23 was 35,000 crores, and that that. The loss of PTM Bank, I think, will really hurt them significantly. That also, there were some compliance issues even in the loan aggregation business. So, it's a complicated business, semi-regulated, heavily regulated, and unregulated. They've got they're all three segments there. there. And you know, to give a handle on all of this is a bit difficult. As I said, I think it's better to just wait and watch how, how these things play out and see how the growth rates pick up after the next two, three quarters post RBI action and then perhaps take a call. All right. So quick hits. Let's run through the companies once again. And if you could just give your thoughts on what investors should do yes. as it relates to these companies. So Zomato, what should existing investors do and what should new investors do? See, I think that I'd like to cover this thing slightly differently, Varun, because these are companies which, you know, we don't have as much visibility. But I've been asked this question many times as to what, how should investors approach these companies? And I would like to have a standard investment approach to all of these, right? That being that, look at them as call options. You buy into some of them, maybe all, all of them. A few of them will turn out to be complete lemons. They will not do, go anywhere. They will lose complete value. But you could have a few winners over here as well, right? We don't know. It could be a car trade. It could be a Nike. It could even be a Paytm because the, they're evolving their business model as well. Their acquisition, they're acquiring companies. They can get acquired as well, right? So, but the business that they're doing now is definitely going to be around for decades. And there's good growth momentum. They are changing habits. They are changing the way people travel, buy online, order food. So they are doing something different. And if you hold them for four, five, ten years, they could turn out to be multi-baggers because nobody has an idea as to how big they can become also. Okay. So rather than, you know, focusing company by company by company, you know, Zomato could have a problem, you know, two, three years down the line where some government regulation makes sure that they can't do this business. So we don't know that. But we know that whatever services these companies are offering will be required for many, many years. 
and therefore a small portion of your portfolio, 5%, 10%, depending on how aggressive you want to be, you could invest in these companies and then keep on adjusting depending upon the performance quarterly which comes through. And of these companies, any, like you said, call option in particular that you like more than the others? So uh, with usual disclosure, I think Sumato and Policy Bazaar seem to be shaping up really well. Okay. Right? And on the watch list should be Car Trade, and on the avoid list right now is Paytm and Nike. Okay. So one final question: There's a lot. There's a lot more companies in this ring coming up in the near future. Oyo, Swiki, and a couple of more. Anyone in particular that you're looking out for? I don't think so. I think in my experience, it's better to let the IPOs come through. Uh, there'll be always high degree of froth volatility when they are listed. Let that settle down. See after one year. See if you have not bought any of these companies for one, one and a half years after listing and then you look at thought of buying them, then you were in a safer place. Yeah. That's something like a Zomato would have earned even a very decent return to you. Yeah. So first year, avoid. A lot of discovery process happens after they are listed. So let's discover these companies. The communication also improves after they are listed and there's coverage. So there's better understanding. So for one year, don't touch them. Then we'll see after that. All right. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that advice. And I'm really confident that our viewers will take that into their portfolios. This podcast is produced by Elixir Equities Private Limited, a savvy registered research analyst. Registration number INA 00004787. The information provided in this podcast is for educational and informational purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice. Investment in securities market are subject to market risk. We strongly advise all investors to read all related documents carefully before investing.